Okay, so Hamish has asked basically, um, if no one couldn't hear it and also for the video, basically, you know, phosphorus does build up in the soil and how readily is that then available to the plant? Is that what you're, you're basically saying? So the, there's a fair few factors that's going to influence that, basically pH, um, things like magnesium as well. Um, so soil testing is probably going to influence this answer. So having a good grounding on where you're at generally with your soils, um, you know, having a concept of where you've got high fertility paddocks to low fertility paddocks um, and working with that. Uh, we, we do know that phosphorus builds and you've only got to go out to the New England to know that they don't get a phosphorus response anymore, but they do get a response when they apply other products, whether it be a soil ameliorant, to actually make that phosphorus re-available. So they've got a bank of money here, they don't have the password to get into it. So as I always say, you know, sometimes things like lime and gypsum are beneficial. Knowing your soil type obviously influences whether you need to fix pH or structure. So um, yeah, to answer that question, yes, there, it, it is there and it's available um, if things are right in the balance of the soil. So you know, there, we could go on about that for hours, I guess, and um, yeah, it's, that's something probably more on a one-on-one -on -one basis if you are having concerns of where you are at with your nutrition and, and going further ahead. But yeah, soil test. Get a soil test, bring one in or get, get your agronomist to come out and take one. It, it's good, you know, yearly if you can, um, trying to take it in the same paddock, same area and at the same time of the year is, is, is pretty important. So, um, anything else on that kind of front? Any Just questions on that, that third thing? Like, does that make sense? What's the difference putting it out in the sprayer or watering it down now for a boom spray? Watering the fertiliser down so it comes out as a liquid? A liquid, yeah. Yep. So, depends what you're trying to achieve. Are you saying boom spray a liquid on or are you saying liquid Jet nozzle. through a yeah. nozzle at the back of the cedar? Well, either either. Yeah, they're different okay. things, so... Yeah. Our, our uh, precision ag bloke here should be able to Answer that for us. Um, well, you want to come up here and have a chat with the microphone, please? So this is Matt Notley. Oh. He's uh, a bit of a ring in there. Off the cuff. Off the cuff. Um, so if you're running it through your drill or your planter, you're going to have a, a streaming nozzle or a streaming effect, which I think is what um, we're getting drawn for us here. And that's essentially trying to replicate putting fertiliser in the row. So you putting a direct band, following that yeah, phosphorus movement. If you use just a normal nozzle on your boom spray, you're having a fan effect. So it's probably similar to spreading in a, in a way because you're getting a, a dilution across the whole row. Um, but you can, if, you've, if you're using a boom, you can get streaming nozzles. I don't know if you've seen them. Um, and I think, I'm used to more cropping, but um, I don't know how many people run 25 centimetre nozzle spacings in this area and you can stream with them and you can get a, a similar effect to streaming out the back of the, the, the drill or the planter. You, and depending again on the source of the liquid fert you're using, so Kyle might be able to answer that one better than me, but it will depend on the availability and the mobility. Yeah. So just to, just to add to that, because that's all good stuff, so this is sort of what they're using when the, the, the crop's already up and we're trying to put a liquid fert on to hit the soil, okay? So we're not trying to look for foliar, right? Because if you put too much N on foliar, it just burns it, okay? Nitrogen is taken up by roots, so that's where we want to get it to. Okay, so this is called stream barring. You can also get them as singular. Um, we used to put them on planters out west um, and that's what you would put down your, down your row. Um, and they just have like a little dish in them with a hole so they, it manages the, the flow, okay? And then that's what you'd put in your planter to go down as a liquid. Um, this here is a fan bar, so that's, that's coming out as a you know, medium coarse spray, okay? And that's hitting foliar. Completely different things, like that's, that's um, trying to you know, add some little bit of fertiliser just to get it through a tough period. Um, some nice. trace elements and bits and pieces. Um, not done a lot. Um, I, I'm not sure it's um, that useful in pastures. But this here definitely can be. And the reason I'll show you, just quickly, if we look back to that description I had with the, the sowing and the fertiliser in the row, it's even better with this stuff, okay? So if you use a, um, an in-row one, okay? I'll just draw a nice wide line 
and we say these are our seeds again, okay? Okay, so this is with the liquid, and then we're going to do one with granule. So th this is the next step up from using a, a granule fertilizer to using a liquid fertilizer, okay? And, and they get responses like this out, out west that I know of. So if you're using a granule over here, same thing, in the row, that's good, okay? But you get a bit of, bit of pee here and there. If you're using a liquid, you're getting a stream, okay, of pee available right next to the plant. So it's, it's, it's over it a lot further, so you can even use less again, in, in theory, okay? Mate. I know some guys will tend to not use foliar in a dry start. They sort of tend to avoid it because it has a bit more chance of burning and false germination, etc. Um, I suppose with the foliar approach, if you've got the crop up, you might have some added bonuses of putting in a, a herbicide if you've got some weeds or something, or but obviously all compatibility um, being all checked there. Hmm. Yeah, I guess from that sowing point of view, we're starting to see liquid setups coming into play. Um, they are pretty efficient in terms of fillability and corn has been the first one I've seen locally like we've probably got four planters now that are running liquids and it's it's great from a um, yeah the guys using them now just yeah. won't go back they'll never go back to granular like they're, they're discussing how they can you know set up their 25 row Duncan with a liquid setup and you know how we can do that because it's just so efficient you know you're back to 50 litres um, so you know, you put in 12, 1400 litres on a front tank on the tractor, you're getting, you know, near 30 hectares instead of stopping every, you know, six hectares to fill up with granular. So, yeah, there, there's a lot of benefits there. So, obviously, again, we can go into depth again because the actual amount of pea you're using, so if you're a purist and you're looking at how much pea you're delivering to your paddock, it's actually less because, again, it's, it's um, well, slightly different form of pea as well, usually, like Yarra, who we use, um, for their liquid starters uses a different form of phosphorus to what you're going to find in granular um, and it's obviously more available to the plant so I, I guess what we probably use in our pasture systems for these flat fans and we've got to be really careful about understanding um, this flat fan um, technique because you can't get a lot of nitrogen on especially if you've got the crop up okay um, you know 15 to 20 kilos of N and it'll start burning after that okay um, what it's used for a lot is projib or herbicides as well. Um, so if you're putting projib out to try and get that extra growth in winter, and I think there's going to be another day that we'll have you before winter, so we'll talk about all that sort of stuff then. But um, if you're putting some liquid in with the projib, definitely works because um, you're already going over it, so you just put some liquid in. What we've got to be careful of, and, and I come across this every now and again, is that not getting this little bit of N for a bit of foliar uptake confused with applying nitrogen for our production. Because you physically can't get enough on, okay? And it's actually not going to the right spot. We want to get it to the roots. Different scenario if you want to go to liquids and do it this way. Yep, no problem. Um, issues around pricing of that compared to adding some granular urea or in our pasture systems. So do the numbers, ask the questions, yeah. make sure you're talking apples with apples is, is my advice before going too far down the road. Does that kind of answer your question in a round, yeah. roundabout loop of covering a few different things? I've just thrown this photo up and it's obviously not specific to what we're talking about now, but weed control, that's what happens when you uh, leave the switch off one of your uh, section controls. That's literally in a, you can see the boom spray width and uh, here to there and one that's clean and one that's not. Obviously this is corn and a pre-emergent, but what I'm getting at is if if there's room to use pre-emergence with things like wheat um, as a sowing option, there is some great products out there that will literally just leave you with wheat and nothing else. And if you're trying to clean up a paddock that's got problems or it's a dry land paddock, you know, there, there are options. Talk to your agronomist. You know, he can advise you on this. So, you know, I'm trying to avoid using chemicals wherever you can. They've got a place um, and knowing what they can do for you. That This crop here was would have yielded 20, 30% less from that um, influx of grass. And it was literally just someone forgot to flick section five boom control on. It wasn't you, Matt, but it's okay. Yeah, well, that would have helped. But anyway, section control was good. In this case, we didn't have auto. But anyway, it was, it's, it's great when you see things like that in the paddock and you're walking across with a grower and you go, you can actually show it because sometimes you go, what am I using these products for? 
And that's exactly why we're using these products. They're not, you know, it's not... Uh, you don't know what you don't see. It, wor it works, you know, and sometimes when you treat a whole paddock with a product, you don't get to see the benefit, and then you see things like that, and it's was a straight line, yeah. There's no, there's no questionability on it. So, anyway, all good. So that pre-emergent we used in the old course to control crabgrass. Yeah. Is that got any benefits in broad scale agriculture? Oh, now you're starting to talk label claims and you know things like that. So it's uh, everything's going to be different. So and there are a lot of products that lap over. For instance, the product used here is. Um, a top claw or dual gold is commonly known. Stuff we use in turf um, is basically exactly the same ingredients as dual gold, but has its own registration, costs twice as much. And yeah, so you've got to be careful. You've got to know what the right product and at the right time. Um, so, you know, turf is a bit of a hairy one, especially from the point of view of registrations, because when it goes wrong, it goes very wrong. You know, it's not like a, a crop, you know, once you kill turf, it's, you kind of, turf farmers aren't too happy with you if they don't have something to do. So, yeah, you've got to be very careful. So, yeah, everything's got a place and pre-emergence do and don't work. If there's, there's a lot of finicky things about it. For instance, as a loosened grower, um, you know, treflan is, is a common pre-emergent used on loosen. I personally don't use it because I can't get the management right. If I had a centre pivot and can water it in and do it perfect, that's textbook agriculture. You'd do it every day of the week. But because my system has irrigation pipes and side rolls and it takes me seven days to get across it and I can't do it in a tight enough window, I avoid using it and I make sure I'm on top of my post-emergent weed control for grass, if that makes sense. So you just got to... It's not something I could answer here. It's a further in-depth... You know, herbicides is really... or well, any pesticide is targeting you, what you're trying to do and, and you want to use them when it's right to use them, not just, you know, the, the thing I hate is guys that just go lay down chemical for the sake of laying down chemical and we see it too often and, you know, Andrew's probably going to talk, you know, in 10 minutes, 5 minutes time, you know, from an animal health point of view we're seeing that. Guys are just using the wrong drench and it's just causing us problems that we don't have the technologies coming through, there's not the money in R&D to be bringing new technologies through. And if we're overusing them, we're going to cause problems with how long we can use these chemical fours and get a result. So I won't get hung up on that because we could. Um, again. Yeah, so I guess all I want to point out here before we get into some treated seed stuff is um, th there's a lot of things that go on when we, we're dealing with animals and biological systems. It's very complex and, and no over two years are the same and we've got weather and, and we've got people to deal with. Um, we just got a lot of things that's, that's going to affect what is going to happen and how successful we're going to be, okay? And the point of this is that, um, you know, we can only control what we can control and the more things that we can put in place as managers and stewardship owners of the farms and bits and pieces, um, the better chance we're going to have of a success, okay? So my point is here is, is there's a lot of things that you can go through um, that, that are going to cause some problems, but um, the, the key is, is you trying to do... You know, remove the thatch, deal with that, get your nutrition right, make sure your grazing's right, all these sorts of things all add up to getting a success going forward. This is just a, a trial that we've done up at Taree, so there's been a lot of trials on, um, I actually run these privately outside of um, um, PGG Rots and Seeds, I've done these uh, about three or four years ago. Um, so we run them over three years and we're looking at treated seed, okay, the effect of um, having in insect um, um, protection on our ryegrass to see what the protection is. What I wanted to show here is temperature plays a really big role. So I always talk to people and, and if we want to write down soil tests, we want to write down four and a half leaf. Another one is look at temp 10 to 20 days post sowing. 10 to 15 days is really important. Okay, so um, temperature's really, really predictable. You can go on and get a long, long forecast of temperature now, okay? It's really important in the success of being able to get establishment. And the reason I want to show you here, this is, um, this is the three years we run, and this is your maximum temperature and your minimum temperature over the three years. Okay, all I wanted to show here is in 2016 and 18, we got really good results from using treated seed. So basically, 
some of, some of the stuff we had to re-sow, right, that wasn't treated, and the stuff that was treated looked 80% and fantastic way we went, okay? They were huge results, huge differences. 2017, everything looked the same. Didn't matter whether it was treated or not treated, okay? Um, they, they all performed well, and that was that year, and it was, a, and it was a lot milder year. What happened in that year in terms of our sowing dates? This is our sowing date for the trials, okay? We had a massive 300 mil rainfall event um, at the end of March. We couldn't actually get on the paddocks because we wanted to sow that first week or second week in, in April, okay? We couldn't get on the paddocks, it was too wet. We didn't go into sort of uh, about, I think it was sort of close to the 20th or 25th of April instead of the first week, okay? The, you look at the maximum, and sorry about the graph, and I probably need to tidy this up a bit, but my point is, is this orange one, okay, this is the 2017, we had all that rain, had some cool conditions, and this is what I talk about, farmers being prepared to take the use of an opportunity when it comes, okay? I don't like talking about sowing dates in terms of start here, finish there, okay? It's based on when the opportunities are there, you, you take them and you, and you utilise that. So here we can see a temperature drop from, um, you know, something like 40 odd degrees, 35 degrees max temperatures down to like 21, 22 degrees, okay? So, um, and then your minimum temperatures are the same, you know, very much the same, we've had the same conditions, our mins are dropped, we've sown, but we're, we're sowing at about, I think the minimums were about 13 degrees here, where when we sowed up here, the minimums were about 16 or 17 degrees, okay? Our maximums, um, we were at about 23 or 4 degrees maximum temperatures, okay? Up here they were about 28 or 29 average. Okay, so all I wanted to point out here is, is the importance, which, and if we look at this, this is nothing to do with moisture. 2017, when we sowed, um, was wet and cool. Um, 2016 was dry, 2018 was wet. Okay, so it was nothing to do with, with the, the rain or moisture availability. It was, it was all to do with the heat stress and insect pressure. Okay, when we got hotter conditions, typically ex insects are a lot more active. Okay, um, this is just a quick uh, plant establishment. Please um, don't get too wound up except for look at the pink bars, okay? So wherever there's a pink bar, that's had seed treatment, okay? These are two different varieties of ryegrass. So one's an annual, one's an Italian, okay? And then the stuff without the yellow didn't have Roundup. So this had Roundup at the start, hence why we could see a lot of ryegrass coming through where this would have had a lot of CoQ. Okay, so we've done it in both. Um, funny enough, we seem to get a better result with the treated seed with our tetraploid annuals, um, and, and they seem to respond better to the treated seed. But as you can see here, where we've got a seed treatment, here again, where we've got seed treatment, we've got a lot better plant establishment, okay? And making a point, this is more your early stuff in the kike. Yeah, yep. So this is an example of exact same seed. So that, that seed in those two rows is the exact same seed, okay? Except this stuff is treated, right? So that's the same seed, same seed, and that's treated seed, and that's not treated. So we're just saying insect treatment. Yep, yep, so it's Poncho Plus. Same as what would generally come standard on your brassicas, yep. on brassicas clovers, chicory. lucens, chicories. All that sort of stuff. It's just rye grasses, it's a... Yeah, option. yeah, because when I first come over and started working in, in the dairy systems in 2012, um, I was working for Dairy Australia too, and I started doing some numbers around the resellers. There was um, less than 1% uh, of seed that was sold that was treated. Right? You go down the south coast and it's probably 40-50%. So I just wanted to know why weren't we treating it and what, what's the differences and, and what is going on with our insect pressure. And I think to add to that outside, you know, slightly different again on country with less trash, you're going to have less pressure. You know, your kite country is susceptible to it or, you know, you're coming off the back of a winter wheat and you're fallowed. Um, we see issues with, you know, where you've got a heap of trash and things like that yeah. carrying over. When you look at that kite queue um, over the last three, four, five months and the insect pressure and, and that's it's going on in that kite queue, it's growing at 200 kilos a day, so you don't see the pressure, okay? Um, especially if you're gonna use some Roundup and stuff. 
Um, be very careful because all of a sudden there's, there's nothing to eat and then you put this poor little ryegrass plant there, okay? And then it just comes up and says, well, thanks very much. Now what's doing it? Um, I'd love to um, be able to afford an entomologist and get them out there on the hands and knees three times a day for six weeks and collect everything that's, that's causing the damage. Um, to be honest, I think it's a number of things. I think it's heat stress, insect pressure, um, and the, the plants just got to a point where it can't get through that, that period. Okay. Yeah, so at a period like this where we've got that amount, is it going to be better for most people to go mid to late, mid, mid, mid rather than early? Well, you're still going to, so to me, I've, I've still got, yeah. If, if we were at a, well, let's say it's a dollar extra on your seed. No, no, you're talking about sowing time? I'm just talking about, I'm talking yes. about even with pre Timing, you've yep. still got all these, you're still going to have all these bugs. Yes. So you're, you're, going yep. have your, you're going to have your insect pressure. And, yes. Um, so even with treated seed, you've just still got, you've still got issues, haven't you? Yes, yes, it's a numbers game. Like, yeah. there's still some plants here missing. Um, if you get enough pressure, you, you're in trouble. So um, the whole idea is, again, when I go back to that slide and show you all those things that's going to cause effect, mm -hmm. it's about what can you do to minimise that effect, mm -hmm. okay? And, and treated seed on early sown stuff um, yeah. is one of those If things. you needed to put feed in, it's a cheap insurance to... We, yeah, we, yeah. we haven't treated seed, but it's just more a matter of no, even with treated seed, are you still better off to go in a season like this yep. later? Yeah. Um, to me, if, if I was sitting down with your farm and looked at the cow numbers you got in bits and pieces and we say we're going to need feed in the winter no matter what, um, I'd sit there and go, well, we need some paddocks planted autumn. We don't, the, the good thing is we don't need the feed at the moment, so let's select some paddocks that we can actually pull out, okay, get some in nice and early, because you're going to then get a grazing off it and you're going to be on better quality feed. If it gets a grazing before winter, it's going to be a 10 times better plant by the time it gets to spring. Because root depth, root depth is so important. The difference last year for us was three grazings. Yep. From the early sown to late sown. Yep. It's just, it's just like it's a no-brainer for me. I want to go everything the second I possibly can get it in the ground. Because... It's just an extra hundred steers I'll push through yeah. because I'll have that much extra feed this year. That's the plan. I'll, I'll come back to that insect pressure thing and, and when I get phone calls and, you know, the seed's not coming up, unfortunately sometimes it's a bit too late. So that's what I'm saying. If you are early planting, think about treater because by the time you make a phone call to your agronomist to come out and find what oh. the problem is, I'm not going to find the problem because they've eaten... They've either eaten it before it's even coming out of the ground, if it's a cut worm or something like that, and cut it off, or you know they've taken most of it away, and by the time you come out, um, basically there's no feed there, so they've moved on. Okay, so. Usually, I think it's worse in the dry years because there's not much in the district for the, especially army drug. Yep. Yep. Whoever gets the first crop in gets smashed. Well, the past two years, so 19, 20, would be the worst years that I'd seen damage. Um, I still remember going up to Dungog. We had a barley crop, sorry, ryegrass and brassica crop. And uh, the, the customer had basically said, oh, the seed is no good. Like, there is not one ryegrass plant. And there wasn't. I, I, I didn't believe him at first. And I went out there and the paddock was full of brassica. Anyway, in the drill seeder runs, anyway, it, it happened to be... Basically, they targeted those ryegrass plants that weren't treated, and, and the reason we identified there was nothing wrong with the seed was he drill seeded another paddock on his way through back home, which was about two kilometres away, and it had all come up beautifully. And I guess the point is the brassica was treated because it was standard treatment of a film coat, and they hadn't attacked that plant, and we ended up finding it was Argentinian stem weevil. But, yeah, it, was a deny it wasn't just... It wasn't even that photo where there was plants. It was nothing. It was... Absolutely zero. So, yeah, by the time, sometimes the, the case is you can't find them. Um, I was saying, you know, I'd say 90% of our seed we sell is not treated. But that comes back down to, you know, going into, you know, ploughed ground and things like that is less pressure than, than um, these situations, dual seeding kike, you know, for instance, your place, Julia, and things like that. So, well, just, just to go on to your three grazings. If each grazing is two tonne, that's six tonne extra. All right, that's um, 6,000 kilos. 
at 10 megajoules of energy if you've got good quality stuff. Um, 60,000 megajoules, all right? 60,000 megajoules um, at 120 kilos um, ME per kilo of beef, okay? It's conservative, eh? Um, and let's say that, sorry, before you do that, we're only gonna graze 60% of it, so we don't get to keep all of it. We're gonna be losing 40%. 36,000 megajoules, okay? 300 kilos of beef, 5,000 litres of milk in that decision. Uh, now, yeah, so it's, it's definitely worthwhile. Again, like I'm not saying the whole farm's got to be like that, but strategically, you're selecting some parts of the farm to try and achieve that. And that doesn't change, how do you put it, that doesn't change what you're doing if it fits in and you can you know get that extra feed is is the benefit and it's not no different in cost or sowing cost or anything like that or seed cost that that's all three extra grazing the yeah. same you know so it's yeah i've just again we kind of spoke about this know when to spray that's probably past the time of spraying but that was uh that was at a uh, loose and paddock at singleton but that that's Get, getting again, getting out in your paddock, having a look. Have I got, you know, aphid pressure? You know, have I got issues there? And you know, get into it and do it at the right time. Again, just reinforcing that fact of not, um, not just going out to spray for the sake of spraying.